great to be with you. Um, two things. Number one, I'm a New Yorker, so I speak very, very fast, and people in the Midwest always tell me, slow down, slow down, slow down. So if you don't understand something or if uh, you have a question, feel free to raise your hand. Um, and uh, somebody say a question? <laughs> no. If you feel raise your hand, if there's something I'm going through that's not quite clear, I'd be happy to answer it to, uh, for you because I like to make this as, as informal as possible. Um, and, uh, you know, the second thing I want to tell you basically is, well, actually, that was the primary thing I want to tell you. Um, slow me down if you have any questions. I come here to kind of give you just a little bit of a flavor of what this market is all about and try to get you to understand sometimes what seems almost irrational in the moment when you look at it. Because many people who come to this market sometimes get, uh, you know, befuddled by what move one way when news is the other way. And I want to just sort of share with you why these things happen. Oops, wait. Sorry. What did I just do on this thing? I'm the worst technical person in the world, probably right after Gary. Um, um, our disclaimer, I will let you read it silently uh, for, uh, for your purposes, but basically uh, know that, of course, we're in a very, very speculative market, and of course, this is the kind of a market that requires only speculative capital if you want to consider it, and everything that we say here is strictly for informational purposes only. Um, but let's go through and try to kind of understand what this market is all about. Why is trading like tennis? Any of you who've ever played tennis know that there's one thing that, that is very critical. Whenever you're watching Nadal, or you're watching Federer, or you're watching any of the great tennis greats, one of the first things you notice is that the tennis players never stand still, right? The key to tennis is that you go to where you think the ball will be, not where the ball is right now, right? It's always an anticipatory sport. That's why sometimes you ever guys watch, you ever watch tennis and a, and a professional player will be running one way, and the ball will be hit behind him the other way, right? That happens sometimes. And you think, wow, these guys are professionals, and yet, you know, they get wrong-footed. This happens to traders all the time. Some of the best traders will get wrong-footed. They will anticipate the event one way, and the event sometimes will go the other way. There's nothing wrong with that. That is actually part of the game. Because the one thing that everybody does in this game is think forward, not what's happening. Now, Gary was being very, very modest when he was talking about the yen trade. He actually put on this yen trade during the collapse when dollar yen was, was coming down all the way through its, uh, through its lows. And the natural inclination, right, the, the sort of the amateur view is to say, well, the dollar, dollar yen is collapsing. I want to be selling it. But the professional view was to say, well, what's the next step? Is it much more likely to rebound after it has an extreme down move? Or is it much more likely to continue going down 200 yen every single second, which, of course, you know, is not realistic. So Gary was actually practicing this kind of anticipatory trading. He was buying at the point of extremes and then selling back when, when, when uh, the market snapped back, much like a tennis player who's, who's running to the corner to catch the ball as it's moving towards that direction. That's the key thing about, about trading, if you want to understand it. It's a very, very anticipatory game. And that's why currencies will fall on good news. And as a matter of fact, stocks very often will fall on good news and rise on bad news, something completely seemingly irrational. But the reason why it's rational is because the market has already anticipated the news and is looking forward to the next, next thing. Now, does the market actually co uh, always correct about thinking what the next, next thing is? No. Sometimes the next, next thing is absolutely wrong about what the next, next thing is. But the key thing to understand is what's everybody focusing on next, not what's happening right now in order to be successful and to understand how things trade in the currency market. Then I'm going to talk to you a little bit about how, um, how wide and, why and, and uh, liquid this market is, but I just want to give you one key fact. If you were to buy IBM stock on the New York Stock Exchange, um, and IBM stock trades pretty tight, let's say 100, uh, you know, by 102 pennies, right? I don't think you could buy more than 20,000, 30,000, maybe 300,000 IBM at that price. In the euro dollar, which is the most liquid currency pair in the world, at GFT and almost anywhere else, under normal market conditions in a quiet, relatively normal market, you could do 20 million on a click, which means that you could buy 20 million of a currency without even moving the price one one-tenth of a penny. That's how liquid this market can be. 
And that's what makes it so incredibly unique. And of course, it's also 24 hours a day. Now, we were talking about the fact that you know you could pull up into uh, into Panera and open up your uh, your web browser and trade. But those of you, how many of you have an iPhone? I bet all the kids in the in the in the uh, FM, right? You don't have to do that. We have an iPhone application. You could just you know drive and trade at the same time. Something I don't re- something I don't recommend. But uh, mobile trading is really the next frontier where all of us are going because the market is 24 hours a day because most people, as we all know, are no longer tethered to their, to their uh, desk and to their computer screen. And everybody needs to be aware all the time of what's going on. Um, as a matter of fact, those of you who have iPhone applications, we talked a little bit about FX360. FX360 is our research uh, product that we publish for, for uh, all the customers across the world. It's actually free. And if you want to download FX360 on your iPhone application, just for uh, just for fun, just to kind of understand what you know what the market is talking about, just to get news flow um, on a daily basis, you're welcome to do so, uh, and you'll be able to be exposed to what the market is doing um, all the time. Um, everybody always asks me, so Boris, what's the only thing? I, what is the one thing I need to know in order to trade this market? What moves this market? And with a big, big disclaimer. All things being equal, and this is a critical disclaimer, the single most important thing that drives currencies up or down is actually interest rates. The surprising thing that I think a lot of people don't realize is that currencies are like ultra, ultra, ultra short-term bonds. Because currencies, you know, like when you think about treasury bills, right? Treasury bills have the least amount of, uh, of yield for the shortest-term instruments. When you're buying a currency, Whatever currency it is, you're actually buying the treasury bills of that country. You're buying uh, an interest-bearing instrument in a very short-term basis. So the higher that instrument, uh, the higher the interest rate that that instrument has, the more valuable it becomes. And going back to our tennis analogy, the higher the probability of the interest rate going up of that instrument, the more valuable that currency becomes. Which is. Um, and I'll talk about this a little bit more, but this is one of the reasons why, it's probably the single most important reason why the U.S. dollar has been so weak. You know, yes, our economy is tough. Yes, you know, we don't know what we're doing. Yes, we blew through the, uh, the financial crisis. Yes, we have a lot of problems on the debt. Everybody else across the world has the same problems. What's the one difference now from, let's say, 2006? Our rates are effectively a bagel, as they say in New York City. They're 25 basis points. They're, they're one quarter one percent, and more importantly, more importantly, going forward, as we you know, as we trade China, as, as as we sort of look forward, there is a snowball chance in heck that the uh, that we're going to raise rates anytime soon, right? As a matter of fact, the whole um, the whole policy of the Federal Reserve has been to constantly keep print, print more and more money and keep rates as low as possible in order to real to reliquify the whole economy. So when the world looks around and says, hey. You know, you're paying me nothing to hold the U.S. dollar. Why should I hold the U.S. dollar? It explains more than any, any, any other reason for why the U.S. dollar has been so chronically weak over the last several weeks. It's not our economy as, as much as uh, everybody likes to believe. It's much more to the fact that I'm not getting paid. Right? Now, I will say that there is a tremendous exception to this rule. And I always use the, uh, I sort of use this example in, in one of my books. Suppose you have two neighbors. One neighbor is a sort of a, you know, stable, good-going guy. He, he's been married he, for 50 years. You know, he's sort of uh, uh, lived in the same place. And he runs into a little bit of trouble. He comes to you and he says, you know, I need to borrow $1,000 until the next, you know, for, uh, to make my mortgage payments next month. And I'll pay you 10% interest, right? And then you have, let's say, another friend of yours who has never owned a house, who has just been a chronic, you know, uh, layabout, and he says, listen, listen, I got a great deal. You give me a thousand bucks, I'll pay you a thousand bucks back in three days, right? Which guy would you trust with your money? You have a, you have a chance to make a thousand percent on your money with a guy who's not a good credit risk versus a guy who's going to give you ten percent in a month. Most people actually are going to trust, are going to take much lower rate of return and, and, and trust the guy with a 10% rate of return rather than gambling on a 1,000% rate of return. The reason I bring this up is because when a country goes into a complete meltdown, like let's say Zimbabwe, Argentina, um, Weimar, Germany, 
interest rates go through the roof, seemingly, oh my God, you know, I could get a thousand percent of the Zimbabwe dollar, yet yeah, the Zimbabwe dollar goes down in, in, into the dumps. And the reason why is because uh, it, it's only valuable to have a high interest rate if you have a high degree of confidence that the country will actually pay you back that interest rate. So that's why I give you a caveat that it's not, you know, don't um, assume naturally just because you have high interest rates. So for example, Turkey or some of the other credits that we see across the world for a long time were very questionable. Ironically enough, now some of the emerging uh, mar uh, market nations like Brazil, which used to have very high interest rates and was considered to be a much weaker credit risk than the rest of the world, are actually look, look to be much better credit risks than some of the industrialized nations. We're now in a sort of a very, very um, unique and strange time in the world where the wealthier, richer nations of the world are in a much worse balance sheet position and are actually much worse, uh, run much uh, more, um, I would say, profligate budgets than some of the more emerging market nations that have higher interest rates. Um, and it's kind of interesting to consider as we go forward. But to show you just, you know, an example, in the, in the currency world, you know, we have about what's called eight or nine major currencies. That is, currencies that have been very liquid. They typically, most of them, with the exception of Japan, all advanced Western industrialized nations. Uh, and Australia is one of them. And Australia, unlike the rest of the world, never really experienced a downdraft after the 2008 Great Recession. As a matter of fact, because Australia is effectively a subsidiary of China at this point, because they simply supply China with so much of their natural goods, they had a huge rebound almost as soon as, as, as 2008 passed. And as their economy grew, the RBA, the Reserve Bank of Australia, started to increase their interest rates continuously in order to make, in order to, to, to make sure there was not enough, uh, there was not too much inflation in the, in the economy. And as you can see, as rates begin to rise from three and a quarter, three and a half, all the way out to, uh, to four and a half, the Australian dollar has soared. As a matter of fact, the Australian dollar now is above parity to the U.S. dollar. Something unfathomable. Just to give you an idea. The Australian dollar at one point was trading 60 cents to the U.S. dollar, so it's almost doubled in its value. And one of the reasons is because it pays much better to own the Australian dollar at 4.5% than it does the U.S. dollar at a quarter percent. But this little blip over here, that's the flash crash. You see this, uh, uh, this the thing? Yeah, this is right here. This was the flash crash of May. When uh, any of you remember the flash crash from May, when the when the Dow Jones Industrial Average went down 900 points in 900 seconds, that was uh, that was when it, one of the effects. Australian dollar, of course, is also, by the way, a, a proxy on risk. And uh, whenever we have fear in the marketplace, whenever investors really pull in their horns and are afraid of taking risky assets, it doesn't matter what the interest rate is; it tends to it tends to fall down. So that's one of the key things to consider. The euro has been indomitable lately, right? I mean, so I was just talking to somebody here said, God, I don't want to go to Europe right now because I'm going to be impoverished just in the, you know, the first day of being there. Um, I was saying to somebody else that, that I was in Switzerland this summer, um, a cappuccino and, and a, peri, a bottle of Perrier at the Zurich airport cost me $12.50. Um, the, the reason why you have such massive currency appreciation in, those, in, in the euro right now is because unlike the U.S., the European monetary policy or the European monetary uh, policymakers are saying that they're going to raise rates. And it's this anticip anticipation, not even that the European, you know, the, the euro right now is 1%, so it's only 75 basis points higher than, than the US dollar, not a big difference. But it's the fact that the Europeans are going to move towards tightening and we stay stationary that's creating this unbelievable power move um, behind the euro. Frankly enough, I can't, I can't vouch for this, but it's just my suspicion. On the day they actually raise rates, the euro will probably go down, right? Because the markets are always, what, anticipating the move, not reacting to the move. That's the critical thing. And, that's the, and people will be befuddled. How come, how come the euro went down when interest rates went up? Because we've had the move prior to this thing where everybody's already anticipating this move going higher. And you can see how well, you know, how well it's done. Now, the other thing that I wanted to talk to you about is... The people that matter in this market, ironically enough, are not the people that you normally read um, sort of on the front page of the newspaper. But in fact, and some of them, one of them you, you probably recognize, but in fact, I would argue to you that these people are more powerful than all of the world leaders that we think about. They're more powerful in many ways than Barack Obama, they're more powerful than Angela Merkel, than Nicholas Sarkozy, than many of the people that we see on, on, on CNN screens all the time. And the reason why is because these are the people that control your money. They set the rate. 
of what you're going to pay on your credit card. They set the rate of what you're going to pay on your mortgage. They set the rate of a million different price inputs that really matter to you on a day-to-day basis. And one of the great things about actually getting interested in this market is you begin to really understand what moves the world. You know, one of the great educations of this market is that you begin to understand who really matters as a, um, uh, as a person of, of interest in terms of power and influence in this world. You start to ignore the politicians, and you start to pay attention to the central bankers. And I wanted to just simply introduce you to some of the key central bankers of this world and just give you some, some, a little bit of a uh, summary of what they're all about. This, of course, is, is uh, Chairman of the Fed, Dr. Ben Bernanke, who um, has been the chairman you know, since 2008. And, uh, you know, there's a picture of him being beleaguered. Love him or hate him, it's very difficult to sort of make a judgment on whether he is going to be judged ultimately a success or an abject failure, how to go forward. But the one thing you have to sort of admit is that for the time being, Ben Bernanke has been able to avert what could possibly have been the Second Great Depression in the United States of America. There was a point in 2008, after the collapse of Lehman, after uh, AIG was going down, when our whole financial system was literally in such a meltdown that almost no financial transaction you can imagine could have been done. You know, I, I hate to always go into the story of like, you know, you think your money is safe in a bank, but you know, you know your money doesn't really exist in a bank, right? You know, all your money is just a fictitious little uh, uh, electronic ledger in an entry, and it can just, you know, evaporate in a second if the whole financial system collapses. So I don't want everybody to go right out and just, you know, start hoarding dollars right now. But we were, we were almost at that kind of a point, and he had to come in and really create almost triage on the, on the U.S. economy. Now, the argument now is that uh, the cure may be worse than disease, that, that basically he has printed so much money. We have basically uh, increased our debt to such an exponential level that, it, it, you know, it may come to, when, it, when it comes time to pay, we're all going to be um, uh, in big trouble, which is one of the reasons why one of the key currencies that we don't talk about, because it's not really a paper currency, has been continuously rising. Anybody care to tell me which currency has been rising throughout all of this time? Anybody know? Gold, right? Gold has been essentially on a one-way trip higher because gold is not a currency, okay? Trust me, you're not going to buy a Starbucks with a, with a brick of gold, ever. But what gold is, is, is a fear trade. When people begin to, to, to believe that the value of the paper currency is worth nothing, that one day perhaps maybe we will have great inflation and every dollar will be revalued at uh, one cent, then people want to have gold, which will maintain its purchasing power. So that's why it's, you know, that's why it's been rising. But Ben Bernanke, of course, you know, is, 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 is caught in a very tough trap. He has a, uh, a tough economy. He's, he has um, a Congress and a, and a U.S. political policy that's frankly in shambles. I mean, we basically have the most confrontational Congress in the, in the world right now, and nothing on the fiscal side is being done. So the only leader of U.S. economic policy is him, and the only thing he can do is print money in order to make sure that the economy continues to function. That's really how, how it stands for him. Now, Jean-Claude Touche is somebody who may not be known to you, but some would argue, now, Ben Bernanke oversees monetary policy over 330 million people. This gentleman oversees monetary policy over more than 400 million people, over a bigger economy than ours, which is the Eurozone economy. And uh, he's a very, very interesting, uh, very fun person to, uh, to kind of watch. Jean-Claude Trichet is a Frenchman, and as you would expect, he is as arrogant as a Frenchman could be. Uh, and he is actually incredibly, um, he's sort of, sort of very fun to watch. Every single month, the European Central Bank uh, has a press conference. Unlike the Fed, the Fed operates very much in the dark. The Fed just simply puts out one little piece of paper, says this is what we're going to do, and then it just comes, you know, then it comes back into its own little dark halls. The ECB has a mandate to be much more open, so he faces reporters every single month like this in an auditorium like this, uh, and they broadcast this on the web. You, you can go to ecb.int and you can watch this every single month, and it's probably some of the best theater in the world because they'll ask him, you know, what do you think of this? And he'll simply say, I choose not to answer that question. Or I have answered this already for you three times. You know, it's just, it's just, it's hilarious to watch him. But at the same time, he, he really tries to be as sort of honest and forthright as possible in communicating the monetary policy of the ECB. And 
the one thing about the uh, European Central Bank that you need to remember is that it's really primarily controlled by a German mindset. Remember, the Germans had, were the only people in the Western world that had hyperinflation. And to this day, they're scarred by the idea of, of, you know, of paying for, for uh, a loaf of bread with a, with a barrel of, uh, of cash, right? Where, you know, every single day, your, your salary would go up by $500,000, and every single minute, the, you know, the, the uh, loaf of bread would go up by $500,000. When, when you have runaway inflation, which is really more of a, a political rather than, than, a, than a monetary uh, event, you are scarred for a very long time. So Germans tend to be incredibly conservative. And since they control most of sort of uh, the money in the ECB, he follows very much that kind of a hawkish attitude. And the ECB tends to be much more hawkish than the Fed. You could make an argument right now. There's many, many analysts who say that the, that the Europeans are crazy to consider you know, ra- raising interest rates in an environment where the global economy is nowhere near uh, recovered to the level that it has. But they see oil prices going up. They see inflation on, on their, um, on, you know, on their uh, uh, rates go up. And they're basically saying, no, you know, we're going to raise rates even if it's going to hurt the economy because they're, they fight inflation rather than fighting uh, rather than having a mandate to fight the economy. One of the key things is that the Fed has a dual mandate. The Fed has to uh, both um, increase the growth of the economy and fight inflation. The ECB, all it has to do is fight inflation, so it doesn't necessarily care about the strength of the economy. Uh, Mervyn King is, is an interesting guy. He's a Harvard-educated guy. He's the head of Bank of England. Now, you know, England is no longer the power that it once was, but England still is London, for example. You know, the reason why we have our office in London is because London is the financial center of the world. And London is still a very, very important place, and the UK is still a very important place in the financial marketplace. Um, so he is caught between a horrible situation right now. In UK, they have the worst of both worlds. They have high inflation and uh, low economic growth because so much of uh, UK growth depends on the financial sector. Basically, at one point, 50% of every uh, five, five out of 10 new jobs in the UK from 2002 to 2008 were created in the finance sector. So once the global economy kind of contracted, the financial sector really, really uh, contracted, they, they, they went into a major funk. But at the same time, their prices still continue to go up. So now they're kind of forced. As a matter of fact, right now tonight, we have much higher than expected UK CPI numbers, inflation numbers, and the pound went through the roof because everybody thinks that the, the DOE is going gonna, is gonna to raise rates. Um, so he's forced, you know, uh, to, to be stuck in this. Masai Shirakawa, uh, you know, the Bank of Japan is the least powerful, and also sort of the most um, beleaguered of all the central banks. Their rates are at zero already. They really can't do much. The, the economy itself is plagued by what? We had a horrible uh, earthquake, tsunami, and a very, very serious case of deflation. They have the exact opposite. Everything in Japan uh, costs less the month forward than it did the month before. The Japanese simply are not spending money at all. So they're constantly trying to get them to spend, trying to inflate, but it, it, it's just not happening. Um, and that, you know, that's, what's, that, that's what happens in Japan. By the way, I want to, you know, some of you may not quite understand why, when bad things happen, does the currency rally? I mean, the single most irrational thing from, from, a, from a sort of an investment point of view was, why did the yen strengthen when Japan looked like it was on the verge of a nuclear disaster, right? I mean, you would think the opposite. You would think that everybody would want to sell their yen and never want to touch Japan again because it would be radioactive for the rest of your life, right? I, it, anybody want to know why the answer, what the answer is to that? The reason is because Japan, Japanese yen costs nothing, right? It's 10 basis points. A huge amount of speculative trades are financed in yen. If I want to buy gold, most of the hedge fund managers in the world will not buy gold in dollars. They'll go borrow yen at virtually no interest rate. It's free money. I'll go borrow a million yen. It, it costs me less than one, less than one tenth of one percent to pay it back. I'm going to buy gold. I'm going to buy oil. I'm going to buy stocks. I'm going to buy stocks all across the world, right? This is called the risk trade. Basically, you're financing something in yen and buying a much riskier asset, uh, hoping that you're going to get capital appreciation. When end of the world trade happens, which in our market happens at least once every 12 to 18 months. And of course, this nuclear situation in Fukushima, and on, fr- on Wednesday afternoon, when, when this is all happening, it really did look like the thing was going to blow. It really looked like we were going to get a big radioactive cloud. It really looked like Chernobyl, too, coming at us. The capital markets freaked out. The stock market went down two, 300 points on that news because the Japanese officials came out. Oh, no, it was the European officials came out and said, oh, the Japanese are lying. It's really much worse than you think. You know, I mean, 
it, it always amazes me how officials across the world can just simply spew out, you know, statements without thinking twice about the impact is on, on the global markets. The global markets freaked out instantaneously. They, all of their risky assets started to sell off. So everybody who financed their purchases of going long the risky assets with short yen had to unwind the trade. The reason why the yen got so strong wasn't because everybody loved Japan or everybody loves the Japanese yen. It was because they were margin called out. It forced to liquidate all of, the, all of those trades. And the technical result of the liquidation is that everybody now gets to buy back the yen that they borrow. And that creates massive moves up in the yen. Combine that with the fact that it broke all the yearly lows. Combine that with the fact that that there was momentum, everybody jumped. At the moment that they broke all those, all the momentum traders jumped and started buying the end, and you created this kind of a calamity, uh, into which Gary stepped right in and was said, okay, listen, it's not the end of the world. Uh, tomorrow they're going to wake up and everything is, is okay. It's all good. They're going to they're going to completely re, uh, you know, redo this whole trade, and that's exactly what happened. Um, and the other trade came back up. So that's, that's what, why something so seemingly illogical was happening in the currency market. Now, uh, and I don't want to take too much time. I just want to go very, very quickly across some of the currency pairs and just give you the headline of the possible reasons why certain things could go up or could go down. Because the key thing we always say is understand the story so you'll understand the trade. These are thematic issues that you're going to be reading about in your newspaper for the next five or six months. Anytime you pick up the business section, these are the key themes that all of the global players across the world will be watching. And depending on how they play out, will depend on whether this goes up or this goes down. So on the positive side, that is your dollar, and, and remember, your dollar, I'm, just, I'm really viewing this from the euro's point of view, not from the dollar's point of view. So euro going lower is a pro-dollar position. Euro going higher is an anti-dollar position. Basically, um, the story in the, in, in the eurozone is that Germany and, and, and France lead the way. We have a bifurcated economy, right? Germany and France pretty much are doing great in Europe. Everybody else in Europe, is, especially Southern Europe, including Portugal, Spain, um, Greece are really doing very poorly. But because Portugal, Greece, and Spain don't really matter, they're like 3, 4, 5 percent of the GDP, um, this always plays much better on the coast. But I, always, you know, I, I hate to use this, but I always say it's like, it's like, you know, if California, New York, Texas, and Illinois do well, it doesn't really matter how the rest of the country does. And of course, the rest of the country always hates it whenever I say this. But it, that's sort of like what the, uh, what is happening in Europe. The big countries, because there's such so much larger percentage of the GDP are doing well, that's really creating the driver behind um, the European growth. This is why it's another one of those illogical things. How could it, how could you be raising rates when so many people are suffering? Well, because the people in, in the countries that are very powerful are actually having inflation, you know, and that's how that's how they're looking at it. Uh, and of course, if ECB, if the key question right now is if the Europeans not raise rates next April, as or this April, as they promised, but actually go on a whole rate hiking routine. That is, they go from one and a quarter to one and a, one and a half to maybe one seven five to maybe even two by the end of this year. If they're at two at the end of this year, mark my words, there's almost very, very little possibility that the euro will not be uh, at 150 or higher at that point. And the critical thing now isn't just that they're going to raise rates, but whether they're going to engage in a whole rate hiking campaign. If that's the case, that's going to be a very, very positive year. Because the one thing I can assure you is that the Fed is going to do nothing until the, at least this year passes through. They really want to uh, see the unemployment rate in the U.S. drop to as close as possible to 8% before they even begin conceiving of, of increasing interest rates. And the other big issue, remember we talked about loaning money to, to, your, to your bum brother-in-law who doesn't do any work and he's a bad credit risk? Well, the bad credit risk in Europe is, is uh, Greece, Ireland, Italy, or well, not Italy, but Spain, and some, some of the southern, you know, Europe, uh, Portugal. If they can somehow reorganize this debt, and as a matter of fact, they're having a meeting at the end of this week, which is going to, again, it's going to hit all the headlines, where they're going to be able to um, reorganize this debt on a long-term basis. And what they've done is they've actually allocated 500 billion euros in a fund specifically designed to make sure that some of these debts are taken care of. Then that issue goes off the table. The euro dies. The euro starts to collapse anytime you hear stories about the fact that but the sovereign debt of various European nations starts to, starts to go down. But if they come up with a national mechanism, one of the biggest problems with Europe has been that it's a union of countries, not a union of states. So they haven't had a unified uh, source of funds. You know, like, for example, um, I don't know if you know this, but Mississippi, uh, Alabama, all of those states actually run massive net deficits to the federal government, right? I mean, uh, Connecticut 
contributes a dollar forty for every dollar it gets from the federal government. Because we have a national government, we can distribute those funds. They're not trying to go to sort of the same kind of a system. They want to try to unify as much of that capital so that the countries that need um, more financing will be able to get it. And if that they can they can arrive at that conclusion, then that sovereign debt issue goes off the table. If they can't, then it comes back and Europe, you know, Europe is under threat. And that's of course the single biggest threat right now to Europe is that PIGS, which stands for Portugal, Italy, Ireland, uh, Greece, and Spain, uh, credit tier rates and ECB abandons rate hikes. Global growth begins to falter. Um, one of the big things that I actually uh, wrote a comment today for, for one of our London newspapers, City AM, is that the market is very complacent. Everybody thinks the Japan, Japanese situation is going to pass by. The whole thing in the Middle East, it's going to be over very quickly. The world is going to go right back to doing business, and we're all going to grow at 3.5% going forward in 2011. But what if that doesn't happen? What if we suddenly have a complete seizure of global growth because Japan is offline, because the Middle East situation deteriorates, not if not improves, and um, uh, China begins to kind of, you know, uh, to, to pull in its horns. Under those conditions, it's very difficult to see global growth really exploding this year. And in that case, a ECB may have to completely track all of its uh, uh, tightening position. If it does, if it suddenly says, no, we're going to change our mind, you'll see the euro go down much faster than you could possibly imagine because expectations will be going the other way. Um, the pound is, of course, you know, ta- also caught in this whole rate hike versus uh, e- economic growth situation. The UK economy has several things going against it. Number one, it's finance-driven, and, of course, the financial market is still a little bit under a lot, a lot of stress. Secondly, they have massive, massive the reliance on the state. 50% of UK GDP is... is uh, Actually, government driven. The government spending is 50% of the UK GDP. And the government right now is really trying to curb its spending. They, they brought in a conservative government that's looking to slash spending. Now, in the short term, that may be, you know, in the long term, that may be the positive thing, but in the, in the short term, that really puts a huge death on your GDP. So they're now in a situation where their economy is actually contracting, contracted last quarter, but they have a high inflation. And the Bank of England is kind of caught in the middle. Uh, forced to have to raise rates, but really doesn't want to. And it's the fact that, that, that the market thinks they're going to be forced to raise rates that's driving the pound high. Um, if it doesn't, if it doesn't, then the pound starts to come in. You know, the yen, I think, you know, we talked a little bit about what happened to the yen. One thing we didn't talk about was what happened just a few days ago, global intervention. One of the sort of cruelest ir- ironies of the world is that the worst possible thing that can happen to Japan is to have a strong currency right now. Because Japan is such an export-driven country, right? Japan still generates a huge amount of its growth by selling to the rest of the world. So if its currency is very, very expensive, it's unable to sell, it's unable to export its way out of this disaster, right? So when dollar yen dropped below 80, that was absolutely unacceptable to Japanese policymakers. They simply could not sustain those low levels because it would mean that their exporters would be decimated and they wouldn't be able to grow out of uh, all of this massive amount of spending they had to do in order to recover from the earthquake, which is why they appealed to the rest of the world, to G7 nations, to come in and and intervene in the markets. Um, And although, you know, we do have probably the freest markets in the world in the sense that that the the, 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 uh, one of the great things about the forest market is completely unfettered. You know, um, it trades on publicly driven information. One of the great things I love about this market is that there's almost no inside information, right? Every piece of data that really matters to this market is publicly available versus with stocks where 90% of the information is actually privately held, right? How, how well the company is really doing is, 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 is knowledge that insiders know rather than the outsiders know. So, but because it is a free market, occasionally we do have policymakers come in and say we can't, you know, we can't have the market overreact this much. And they did come in and support it. And the support, what makes this support this time so different is that it's a concerted, unified intervention by all the G7 uh, member nations. Now, it may fail. This could be a situation where it could fail and the market could simply push down. But last time they did this, it's a very rare event, was 1985 in the Plaza Accord in the reverse way. The reverse way, that's when the dollar was actually um, very weak and they had to strengthen the dollar. And the dollar strengthened by 55%. So if a dollar, you know, um, uh, excuse me, the dollar had to weaken that reflection. This time they want to straighten the dollar. So whether they move dollar yen by 10 or 20 percent higher over the next year, it's hard to say. But the point being is, I would bet against all the global central banks in the world. They just have too much firepower, 
uh, for the market to consider. And that's one of the key things that could push Dali yen higher in terms of intervention as we go. In addition to which, in addition to which, if we start to see an improving U.S. economy. Because improving U.S. economy will give investors confidence that, yes, the Fed will eventually stop printing money, and then the next step, maybe even consider possibly beginning tightening as our um, unemployment levels uh, get higher. The key numbers that we're all watching in the, uh, in the currency market is 200,000 non on payrolls. If we can produce 200,000 jobs for three, four months running in a row, that will give you a very, very good um, reason to want to be long dollar yen because it means the U.S. economy is finally starting to have a sustainable recovery. If we don't, then we see this, you know, this kind of very uh, frustrating muddy water situation as we go forward. Um, the Australian dollar, we talked a little bit about the fact that it's basically a risk proxy on the rest of the world. I am actually bearish the Australian dollar at this point because um, Australia depends very, very heavily on China. And China has, I think, peaked as far as, its, as far as its growth goes for the time being. They've raised their rates tremendously because they have a huge amount of inflation on the ground in China. And China is no longer going to be the kind of a massive buyer of Australian goods that it once was. And that, in fact, is going to stop the RBA, the Reserve Bank of Australia, from raising rates any further. As a matter of fact, they've gone now from saying they're going to they're gonna stop raising rates to maybe consider even lowering rates. And remember, that's the one thing that's going to move prices up and down. If the, Australia, if the RBA decides to lower rates, then the Australian dollar below uh, parity could be a very real possibility as we go forward. And last, our neighbors up north, who have been doing great. I mean, you know, anybody have Canadian relatives here? Uh, you might want to live there. It's, uh, it's nice. They are they're killing it. Uh, the Canadian dollar is below. It's worth more than the U.S. dollar. Worth more right now. Uh, and it's at a three-year high. And the easy, simple explanation is, of course, because of oil. Oil at $100 a barrel. I mean, Canada is the uh, Saudi Arabia of the uh, north, right? We get, all of, we get most of our oil now from Canada. And the, high, the longer those prices stay at, at above 100, and uh, the higher they go, the stronger that economy does. The Canadian economy is not only resource-based, but because resources create such a massive marginal profit to its economy, um, it, really, uh, uh, it really supports the Canadian dollar. So in many ways, the Canadian dollar is a proxy of the price of oil. If you think oil prices remain high, and as we're sitting here with news overnight, you know, of, of, of much deeper quagmire in Libya than we may, that we may be seeing, and still tremendous amount of flashpoints all across the Middle East, and the probability that the flashpoints are going to exacerbate, not cool, as we go through the rest of the year, the prospect of $100 barrel oil as a reality of our lives may be, uh, may be quite serious. Um, you know, bad for all of us, but good fit for our friends up north, and uh, it's probably very strong for Canadian power. So I, uh, I thank you very much. I hope you guys found this a little bit of interest. If you have any questions, feel free to, uh, you know, if they ask me, I'll be happy to answer anything that you guys have. Any questions? Yes, sir. Right. I, I, I'm, a, I'm not a gold bug, and I'll tell you why. It's, it's, it's still an, it's an artificial medium of exchange, right? I mean, it's just gold is pretty useless. If you think about it, gold, it, we, we no longer we don't even use it in our fillings anymore. Right? I mean, it's just useless. It's, it, it is valuable, and it's not only because you think it's valuable, you know, but as a, um, it's, it's also incredibly um, um, impractical uh, as far as, I mean, the reason people went off the gold standard was because, because it became impractical. The economy grew, outgrew the amount of transactions the economy does, completely outgrew the, uh, the value. And I want to just say something, you know, you always hear the story, the U.S. dollar is worth five cents of its original value in 1990. It's true. You know, we've deflated the dollar completely. What they don't tell you is that our standard of living has increased by a thousand percent. So I'd rather make the trade-off of, okay, I'd rather have a little bit of inflation and deflate our currencies, and yes, we're all going to go through all this trouble, but at the, at, at the, uh, at the uh, not the expense, but at the benefit of having a much a more flexible growing economy. Um, that doesn't mean that, you know, that I think it's, it's okay to print money endlessly, but I don't think the gold standard is going to be our solution. Um, you know, I mean, I do think we are... 
we will ultimately have to repudiate a lot of our debts that we, that we currently have. We'll have to restructure them uh, in, in a month. I don't think anybody, any, any one of these, you know, young people sitting here thinks, realistically thinks that their Social Security uh, money will ever be there for them. Uh, in, you know, in any reasonable way, shape, or form. So, I mean, I think we have to accept those realities. Um, yes, yes, sir. Well, no, it's the other way around. The whole point is that, is that you know, by now, the Fed is making this argument, which, by the way, fell flat on its face, that there is no inflation, right? I mean, yeah. Tell me, in your day-to-day life, have prices gone up or gone down for your, for your you know, daily goods, Right? I, it's it's any, anywhere I look, every, everywhere I look, I get a little notice. We're raising our price, we're raising our price. I'm like, what, what happens to deflationary argument with the Fed? The Fed makes the argument that, that if you take out oil and food, which are the two most important things that people spend their money on, there is actually no inflation. And that's been, you know, and that's true. But even that argument is starting to falter as, 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 as oil and food are starting to seep themselves into all sorts of uh, goods, including transportation goods. The great offset to inflation has been technology, right? I mean, technology has been our only saving grace. We, computers have gotten faster. We've created all sorts of, you know, uh, of products that are much cheaper than they used to be. But I think even that trend is exhausting itself relative to the, uh, to the cost of inflation. You know, an average person every single day, I think all of us will shake their hands, that it, everything from parking to, to movies to food to everything, it costs much more. Um, and inflationary pressures are bubbling up through the, through the system, which is why they're arguing that the, that the Fed really has to raise rates to temp, temper some of it. But ultimately, it's not the race. That, the, the problem here is the inflation is being driven by high price of oil. That's really the key thing. And the high price of oil is not anything we can do with rates. It has to do with us somehow taking, take, you know, creating uh, control of the Middle East and getting oil prices to come back down, you know, pacifying the Middle East, which is really you know, a, a very much more difficult problem than just raising rates. Um, any other questions? Yes, sir. Sure. Uh, you know, because I, I, I limited amount of time, I just want to sort of uh, get a little too technical, but Euro yen, it's, 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 a, it's a cross, cross currency between European, uh, Euro and the yen, tends to be a currency that really uh, used to trade very much with risk appetite because, um, you know, the Euro was viewed as a higher yielding currency, and of course the yen is a lower yielding currency, so it used to go up and down very much with the, um, uh, with the value of the Dow Jones Industrial, the S&P 500 uh, average. It had a, you know, since intervention, it's had a big run. Uh, Euro yen has actually broken through a lot of key technical levels. But I'm also very, very skeptical of that move because, again, that move assumes that everything is hunky dory, global growth really uh, recovers. You're, a long Euro yen bet is basically a bet on the fact that global growth recovery uh, proceeds and actually exceeds the current market expectations. But I think every time we've seen high oil prices stay for a sustainable period of time, we've always had a recession in this country, or we've had a recession globally. Yet, people still underestimate the, the negative power of high, of high oil. All of us, I mean, I'm watching, I was watching the cars here. My God, they're like tanks. I, I can't imagine what you guys paid here in your, um, in your, in your gas bills. But that is, for the average human being, the single greatest, um, in, the single most important price is the price um, uh, of, of ga- a gallon of gasoline. And since that's going up, that just creates a massive um, tax on the consumer, much worse than any kind of other tax the government p- puts on us. So I'm, I'm, that's why, if oil prices come back down to 80, I'm much bigger bull than if they stay at 100 for, for another month or two. That's my sort of, you know, macro view of the whole thing. Yeah. Yes, sir. Uh, well, you know, I, I, you know, we're talking about worldwide exchanges. We, you know, we're, we're, we're still moving slowly but surely towards that. I, I, currencies, what, what is interesting, though, is... The euro has shown the world that you could actually have a unified currency um, without having a unified political structure. In other words, you could have a currency without a country. And there are many countries in the Middle East where, you know, we have offices in Dubai, in the Gulf, that are actually considering creating a unified A unified currency is tremendously valuable. If you think about it, if we have Michigan dollars and New York dollars and North Carolina dollars, the amount of, of inefficiency 
of having you know constantly exchanging this stuff and the amount of arbitrage because somebody of course knows oh Alabama dollars are down today and you know, Carolina dollars are down so there'll be a huge amount of you know unnecessary speculation between the two dollars that will they'll be very uh, economically disadvantageous all of that it gets evaporated when you have a single currency so I think you're, gonna, you, you're talking about in, in uh, Middle East they're talking about the uh, uh, Gulf currency and in Asia they're talking about the AGM currency of the of the uh, ten Asian countries having a single currency I think that trend. If, um, if the global growth continues, it might actually be uh, a reality uh, 10 years from now. Yeah. Yes, sir. Yes, it would. But, but, but as I said, I think the risk is small. And even if uh, uh, my, my argument is that we're not going to go to one single world currency, we're going to go to global currency blocks. You know, and, and for, for us, for our purposes, it'll actually be great because it will simplify. Everybody will be trading Asia instead of 5,000 little currencies in Asia. They'll be just trading one big Asian currency, one big Middle Eastern currency. It will actually be, for us, great because it will create more markets, more liquid. Just like the euro created the single most liquid instrument in the world. Euro trades $1 trillion a day. Nothing even comes close to it. Um, so from our perspective, from trading perspective, it will actually increase markets, not decrease them. Yes, sir. As I said, the critical thing to determine whether the Fed is going to exit is watching the non-farm payrolls every single month. The Fed will not even consider this uh, act unless and until they see three or four months of 200,000 plus jobs. They need, the Fed, the Fed is, is, is a task with a dual mandate. They have to grow the economy and control inflation. It's, 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 a, it's a Pandora's you know, uh, choice. And right now, they're very much focused on growth of the economy. They couldn't care less. They, they basically made a you know, conscious decision. We don't care about inflation. We need to make sure people go back to jobs. So until and unless they see some evidence of that, they're not going to do anything. Yes, sir. Uh, still continues to be uh, gold or commodity-based currencies. So Australian dollar, Canadian dollar tend to perform, you know, pretty well in, in an inflation. Any country that, that uh, has hard assets as, as a primary source of its uh, economic might is a good proxy for, you know, for, uh, for inflation. Because obviously under inflationary regime, hard assets uh, rise in value. Yeah. Um, Silver has been on a tear, by the way. I don't think you guys have been watching. Silver has been a much bigger trade than, than gold. It, you know, it, 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 went up, uh, it broke all time highs and it's, you know, 36 now. So, um, anyways, well, I thank you. If there's no more questions, I thank you very much for coming. I hope you guys enjoyed it.